Hello everyone, welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm James Milan, and we are back in the studio for our one of our regular meetings with our state senator, Cindy Friedman. Always a pleasure to talk to Cindy, always illuminating. So thanks, as always, for coming in. Good to see you, James. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. We know that uh, that this is not an easy morning for you, right? <laughs> right. I know. I know. I, uh, this is one of my workout mornings, and um, they, they really put me through the paces today. So I'm... Um, but they're wonderful. I actually go to uh, Fitness Together on Broadway in Whoa, Arlington. Nice plug there. Are, the, I want to give them a great <laughs> plug. They're amazing, although right now I'm not real happy with them. That's right. About, it was a workout with capital W, capital, w, capital O today. Yeah. But yeah. all right, we'll see if we can revive you during good, good. <laughs> during the conversation. Um, oftentimes when we're talking and we like to get you know a general update about what's going on at the State House and with your priorities, et cetera, and obviously we are going to get to that. But oftentimes we, we start there and then we end up talking about Arlington specific issues near the end of the conversation. I would like to invert that today um, and start by uh, saying that, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about where the budget is and the surplus of money that uh, yeah. we know is uh, the case in, here in 2019. Um, but just tell us about how either budgetary decisions or allocations or other kinds of policies um, are going to be impacting Arlington specifically? Okay, I think there's a couple um, things that are noteworthy. Uh, first, we had a good budget this year, and um, we increased money for uh, Chapter 70, which is education, and we um, funded uh, local aid. And so I think Arlington got about $14 million in um, Chapter 70 money, and I think uh, about $7 million in, in, in local aid, and don't hold me to those because right, I don't have right. in front of me. But, um, but so are those, sorry to interrupt, but are, are those numbers like, so it's $14 million compared to something else, something $12 million before, or is it actually $14 million more in No, in no, it's, it's not $14 million more, but it is an increase okay. in... Um, and right now we did mostly that increase in um, uh, in specific um, student funding. So we increased the, the number of dollars per student that mm, we did. Okay, great. Um, we also, um, as part of the supplemental budget, we put in money for um, additional money for Chapter 90, which is roads and bridges, which is something that um, w will support Arlington, hopefully. Um, and then we also had some, I put in some earmarks. Uh, we, about, I think it was 175000 for Arlington Youth Counseling Center, um, $85,000 for Food Link. Um, we also did, uh, I put in some money for English at Large, which is a wonderful Woburn program uh, supporting immigrants learning, um, learning English. Uh, so we got some of those earmarks in and that. Um, right. So just to clarify for those in the audience who might not know, earmarks are kind of uh, budgetary allocations to, very, to, to specific, specific projects to specific or organizations. Projects. Or, yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. It's and a way are, of us getting, it's a way of us being able to support specific local um, local work. Okay, great. And, uh, and AY, you know, I'm sure the program in Woburn, as you say, yeah. is really excellent. And we all know that AYCC and Foodlink Food are both right. very valued, valued institutions in this town. Yeah. So good news there. Yeah, yeah. And the, the great thing, too, about Foodlink is that it covers my all my whole district. So uh -huh. even though it's, it's Arlington based, right. they work with um, people all over the district. So I feel like it's it's something that benefits all my communities. And yeah, that's a great feel, that's yeah. a great point that yeah. Foodlink is based in Arlington and was born in Arlington, right. of course, but as we know, is continuing to spread it, its tentacles yes. in the best way. In the best possible um, way. So, yeah, yeah. Broad, more and more broadly, which is great. Right. And probably the money that you you know got for them is go only going to help with those yes. with yeah. those efforts. Um, I, I don't want to interrupt. Were, were you? No, I mean that. So I think in the the budget. Specifically, those were some of the um, pieces that I think were Arlington, um, you know, specific. Along with the how much money we put into, for instance, the Department of Mental Health, we we have nine hundred million dollars um, that we, you know, the Department of Mental Health budget. A hundred million of that is for, is for children, or actually, in addition, 
there's $100 million for, for children's mental health. Um, those are the kinds of things that I feel like support all of right, our of communities across the Commonwealth. Um, so those are some of the budget um, items that you mm -hmm. know, I might point out. It was so long ago that I <laughs> <laughs> we're on to the new budget, the right. supplemental budget. Um, so I'm trying to remember, okay, what was in which one? Um, right. So in a sense, it was so long ago, and yet budget issues and questions are still with us. Yes, because, they are. We have. You know, we were talking to you as well as our state reps a couple of months ago and got the word from all of you that, uh, that as you just repeated, it's a good budget this year and obviously a good budget. Uh, can be and often is defined as more money more there money, for right. lots of worthy programs. Um, and, but I, from what I understand, and I would love some clarification, the, the actual um, allocation of, especially there's surplus money to be spent, et cetera, there, this is stalled in some way, or can you just tell us what's sure. going on with the budget so right now? So there's two pieces. One is the annual budget, which we passed and is moving forward. And then there is what we do throughout the year, the supplemental budgets. And at the end of the year, there is a supplemental budget, which is called a closeout budget. And basically what it does is it makes whole any accounts that may not have gotten enough money. So perfect example is, is SALT. Okay, the, 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 um, you know, the salt and the plowing mm -hmm, budgets. And we mm -hmm. know you put a certain amount of money in, depending on the year you have, you may have put enough money in or you may not. And at the end of the year, you make that account whole. So that's what a closeout budget does. Mm -hmm. This year, we had supplemental money. We actually had more money uh, to the tune of maybe $1 billion. Um, at the end of the year. So there was a effort to say, okay, what should we do with that money? First of all, let's close out. Let's make right. everybody whole. Secondly, let's put a chunk of that, a large chunk of that into the stabilization. The rainy day fund. The rainy day sense. fund. Mm -hmm. And then we have some money left over to fund some programs that are important to us to fund. Um, so we did that. And for instance, in the supplemental budget on the Senate side, we put in money for um, uh, sidewalks and streetscapes for Arlington. So there's $66,000 in there for Arlington to, uh, to support the Broadway Plaza. There was streetscapes and sidewalks for Lexington I put in and streets for, for, um, for Bill Ricca. So those were some of the things that we got to put in. Um, we had some more money for substance use disorder we put in put that money in. Um, what's happening now is this procedural issue of how we, so the House did theirs, they did their supplemental budget, we do our supplemental budget, we send our supplemental budget back to the House, mm -hmm. and now what's happening is what's going, something is going on in the House for how they need to move that piece of legislation forward so that it can come back to us so that we can have a conference committee and work out the differences. Mm -hmm. And right now, the procedural issue is in the House, and they've got to figure out for all sorts of inside baseball reasons yep. how they're going to move that bill. So we're sort of, the Senate is kind of sitting there going, just kind of, mm, okay, let's kind go. Of let, let's, we'll help you, but let us know. And so there's some back and forth going on. So that's the money that's stalled, mm -hmm. not the big, not the FY20 budget money. It's, it's the closeout for FY19 and some additional money right. that people would love to have. Okay, so um, again, we're, we're talking about, as we've mentioned in the past, good problem to have. It's Good a problem great problem to have to, to, have, have, right. to figure right. out, oh, extra money, how are we going to allocate right. it, et cetera. But nonetheless, things work the way that they work or don't work the way they yeah. don't work right. um, in the State House, and we're stuck right now right. In, in a moment. So right. hopefully moment, this gets resolved it, it will quickly get resolved. and it then will get things resolved. start moving yeah. along. Yeah. We can feel confident, though, that the things that you said, um, the, the, um, the money going to Arlington, Lexington, um, Bill Ricker, et cetera, for these streetscapes, it will 
it will come yes, available. Yes, I have I have confidence soon. that those that, that Great. we will see that money. Mm -hmm. um, anything else you wanted to say about the budget more generally, or um, just that uh, we also got a five million dollars in the budget for um, substance use disorder treatment and harm reduction. I think that that's a really important piece that we're going to put more money into um, those activities and those services and organizations that reduce harm around substance use disorders. Okay, so. so I actually did want to ask you about that because I noticed the artful use of language um, in, 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 in referring to what you're talking about as harm reduction sites. I know that other people would have other things that they call such places. Oh, yes. The, so describe what you're sites, talking right? about. <laughs> right. Okay. So there's harm redu reduction efforts. So that's things like um, making sure people have clean needles to use mm -hmm. um, to stop the spread of HIV and Hep C. Um, there's um, access to people who have substance use disorder, increasing their access to just general health care. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Very important. Um, there's programs in, that are, are helping people with substance use disorder. That's important. There is also another piece, and this is what people have been talking a lot about, which is called a, um, a safe use site or safe injection site or right. harm reduction Hi site. Highly controversial, we have to say. I highly think. controversial, um, which would allow um, there to be a place where a person with a substance use disorder who's using can go use their drugs with oversight from medical professionals to make sure that they're, first of all, to watch to make sure that if there's a reaction, somebody's there, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that their paraphernalia is clean, um, that they don't reuse needles or that they're not, um, they don't stop infection, things mm -hmm. like that. And then also to create a safe, supportive place which every bit of research says, when you provide these kind of places, you allow an opportunity for a door to open to treatment. So while the first and foremost, we want to keep people safe, the also the benefit of it is that you are, you can create a space where certain people would be willing to then go into treatment. So I think, on that last point, that's probably where critics of this would would be, you know, would, would voice some skepticism about, you know, how right. strong the evidence is there or something like that. But I am uh, intrigued by the fact that, again, if we, I'm happy to refer to them as harm reduction sites for the okay, moment, yeah. um, but that those places. Are, are really bringing into high relief this wrestling match that has been going on for the last number of years in this state at least of how to look at the opioid crisis, right. et cetera. Is it something that is a criminal, that should right. be treated in a criminal way? Should it be treated as a public health issue? And th this really does kind of put that, you know, make that in, in rather a bold spotlight right. on that very intersection there. Right. Yep. Um, and I assume that you are, a, well, I'll ask you, I shouldn't assume. Um, are you a supporter of, of the, this approach? Yes, I am a very strong supporter of this approach. Um, I absolutely firmly believe that substance use disorder is an illness and not a crime. Now, people who sell drugs, people who, you know, are on the, you know, are out there trying to hook people and, you know, make money, um, they're they're criminals, and there's just no question about that. But somebody who has who uses drugs, who's a sub, has a substance use disorder, um, that is an illness in every sense of the word, and. Um, we need to start treating it like the illness that it is. Nobody decides that they want to be addicted to heroin or opioids or methamphetamine. It's not a happy life. Um, these people are just, at that point, just trying to survive. So it's our job to help them in any way that we can. And we have different programs for people, but we don't, we don't have every door. Not every door is open, and mm -hmm. it has been shown that at least you need to keep people alive and safe 
before they can get treatment. If they die, they can't get treatment. And um, so this is just another tool in the toolbox. It has shown that it doesn't increase drug use. It doesn't increase crime. In fact, it reduces crime because people go to places and are not victims mm -hmm. um, or they you know, are not victims of crimes, which is often happens, especially for women. Um, and there's medical intervention. So I just very strongly believe that it's, and it can't be about our comfort. It has to be about what works mm -hmm. for an illness. And um, there's no other illness that we would get into this kind of discussion around saying, well, should we give them a treatment that we think works? Right. And again, you've just articulated that you see that the, the you know, for those who would be um, using a harm reduction site because they are drug users, right. um, that really, on a societal level, the people that they are most likely to harm are themselves. Are themselves. That's right. At that point, right. And not others. Right. So right. that's a, a, an important point. That reminds me of the fact that you're also working on legislation, I believe, to address another aspect of that, which is Section 35 right. civil. Right. Well, you, you tell us okay. about that. So Section 35 is a section in, the, uh, in a chapter in the Mass General Laws that allows uh, somebody to go to court and ask the court to intervene for a loved one or somebody they know um, who has a substance use disorder and is a harm to themselves. It is an imminent risk. Um, so if my child, for instance, is, um, has an opioid addiction, um, and I can't, I'm worried that they're going to die. I can go to the court and say, will you um, put this person in, in, into in involuntary treatment for, uh, and it's a very defined amount of time. And um, if the court finds that that person is in fact a harm to themselves or others, they will then commit them to a treatment program. It's called a civil commitment because nobody's done it. They haven't broken any law, you know, they haven't, you know, robbed anything or, um, or hurt anybody, but they're hurting themselves. And so that's a civil commitment. Currently, you can, under a civil commitment, be placed in a correctional facility that is treating substance use. Uh, like, and the big one is MASAC down in Plymouth. Mm -hmm. um, we, I firmly believe that nobody that is civilly committed that has an illness should ever ever be placed in a correctional facility. It is not where they belong. If you had a heart attack, we would never consider sending you to a hospital in a prison. Mm -hmm. this, what this bill says is that the, the state is on the hook for having enough beds so that people with civil, who are civilly committed because of a substance use disorder go to a treatment center that is not part of a prison. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I suggest everybody, you know, Google MASAC and find out all of the stories that have been going on around there for people who are civilly committed and how they're treated um, when they are in those facilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't belong there. It is, not the, it is not a medical model that we should be perpetrating, and that's what this bill would say, is you can't do that. Mm -hmm. And you said that it puts the onus on the state to ensure that there are enough beds. Is that because, at least in part, the response to critiques of the current system is, hey, there aren't enough Yeah, I mean, that's what the courts will say, is if you take this away from us, we don't have places to send these people. And in fact, it's a valid, it's a valid concern. In the western part of the state, the only treatment center is in the House of Correction, um, in Hamden. That is the only place in the western part of the state where somebody who ha has a substance use disorder and is committed civilly, there's no other place for them to go. They'd have to go to Worcester or go to Boston. And that's a very valid issue. Mm -hmm. There's, we need to have places in the western part of the state. Um, but so, that's our job to figure out. And that's the, why we have the department um, of Public Health and the Department of Mental Health and the Executive Office of Health and Human Services. So. Right. So hopefully the, if the bill goes through, in fact, we'll just see more facilities. We will see more facilities in places, in places where we, yeah. yeah. 
Great. Um, interestingly, this topic that we were just talking about, I think, is a good intersection of two of your main concerns as a legislator, I know, and that is, you know, health and public health, um, and um, and also the criminal justice just the system and how those two things you know, yeah. collide a right. lot of the time, yeah. right? And, yeah. and don't necessarily work all that well together. Um, I'm wondering uh, if I can now just zoom out a little bit and ask you more generally, these are, these are both areas that you're always, I know, working away um, uh, to file legislation to help different constituencies and constituents. Um, what's, what's, what's the update on what's going on with some you know, the, yeah. the more major pieces you're working on. The governor has just come out with a big omnibus health care bill, which has some really interesting things in it. And um, as the chair, the Senate chair of health care financing, that bill will come to our committee. Um, so we'll be, we'll be having a hearing on that. Um, we are working very hard in the Senate um, on specific pieces. Um, I think you're going to see a pharmaceutical bill very soon coming out of the Senate, um, which is going to hopefully address the issues of the high cost of drugs. And uh, I don't know if anybody had noticed, but when the state every year does a, a cost trend hearing where they look at the cost trends in, in, um, in health care, and um, one of the biggest increases has been in pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. as and I, I bet you could randomly call anybody and they will say yeah um, I either my either um, drugs went up or I they're no longer they're uh, covered um, and now I'm paying out of pocket um, so it's a it's a huge issue so we're going to be looking at that specifically and then we'll um, we're going to be looking at next pieces mm -hmm. um, so whether the Senate does an omnibus bill or not is up in the air, but we will be doing health care um, and taking up a lot of the pieces that you saw in the, in, in governor's, the governor's budget and mm -hmm. that in the governor's bill. And that bill will, it will have a hearing and then it will go to the House because it was filed in the House. So mm -hmm. they'll take it up first. Mm -hmm. Last session, we did a health care bill first, sent it to the House. They did one, but we never reconciled it. So let me ask you, as you know, now you've been at this for a while, um, working between the Senate and the, and the House, et cetera. How hopeful are you that something of substance, no pun intended, um, will, will come from the pharmaceutical, you know, the work on, on you know, uh, kind of restraining yeah. um, prescription drug prices, et cetera. How, how hopeful are you that something real is gonna, is gonna come from this? I am hopeful. Um, I think that there's so much pressure on the system that if we don't address pieces of it, there's gonna be a real, um, it's, it's gonna implode even more than it is imploding today. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a sense among my co-chair in the House and you know House members, I'm sure, and the Senate that we absolutely have to continue to address health care. Um, I don't think that's a question. The question is always, how do you do it? Okay, and there is so much at stake in health care. There are so many players that have so much skin in the game, especially around money, mm -hmm. that it is a real effort. It will take a real effort on our part to move that for, to move the, the cost containment forward. Mm -hmm. Because it really will mean that some people are gonna have to make a little less money. Right. Um, that we have to get costs out of the system. And these aren't costs that are helping improve healthcare, they're costs that are going into the pockets of people doing, of, of companies mostly doing business. Right. And I am all for people making a profit, I'm all for you know, innovation, but at some point, it is so affecting the consumer, they are not seeing the benefits of all of these great new fabulous things that we're doing in the healthcare space because they can't afford it or it's not accessible. So revenue at the expense of the consumer is something that we really have to address. And that's 
what we're looking at. It's got to be about the consumer. And I can hear the urgency in it, your yes. own voice. And I assume what you're saying is that you're, you're, you're far from alone, that you, you have that sense from your colleagues, from the two chambers, that there is this feeling yeah. in the same uh, way as you're I, describing that something has to be done yeah, about this yeah. and soon. Right. I, I think that's true. I mean, the governor put a great stake in the ground around pharmaceutical pricing. I don't, I, I may not agree with exactly the way that they're doing it, but they absolutely put a stake in the ground and said, we're serious, we've got to do something about, about the cost. So, so we know it's coming, that, that they recognize it on the administration. I believe the House recognizes, because they hear from their consumers. I mean, you, you, you should look at the hearing that we did around some cost, pharmaceutical cost prices and listen to the stories of people who, are, who need insulin. I mean, it is, when you start rationing your insulin, when you have pharmacies that are, are telling to people, if you don't use all you need, I know somebody who needs mm -hmm. it and they can't afford it. Um, when you don't go with your insulin, you can't. You go for days because you can't. You're trying to right. You make have it stretch again. Out. You have to, yeah. That this is that's unconscionable. There, you know, there, that is just beyond what any of us should spend any moment accepting. So, I think people get that, and I hope the pharmaceutical companies really begin to hear that. We're serious, mm -hmm. but we have to show it in action. Right. So. Right, especially because, as you said, you're up against yep. and very, they have very a deep very, pocketed very people de exactly. with with a very vested interest in yeah. the status quo. So, uh, good luck with that. Speaking of, though, things that need to be done, and everybody agrees, <laughs> and yet, let's talk a little bit about transportation. Um, do you have anything nice? <laughs> good, hopeful, or otherwise to share with us about possibilities for how, again, to deal with what we have talked about so many times, yeah. a transportation system in this, in this state and in this city even, which is not adequate right. um, to the existing needs, much less uh, you know, looking into the future. Anything going on there that we can hang our hats on at all? Well, I think what we can hang our hats on is that talking about pressure, the pressure is intense, and the pressure is intense on the state to address it. And there's a couple different bills. Um, the House has a transportation bill that they're working on now. I know the Senate, we've been, uh, I know that the, the chairs and um, the committee has been looking at transportation. Um, I think we're getting to a point where we where we don't have to explain to the governor that it is a revenue problem, um, although you never know. Um, I think they're looking at some short-term and some medium-terms uh, and long-term fixes. The, the, the truth, though, about transportation is we do need to fix our transportation system, and we need to do it now. We actually needed to do it 20 years ago. The problem is that anything, what I've seen, that anything we, we're looking at is a long-term solution. We need to do it, but it's not going to immediately reduce sure. the, um, you know, the traffic on 93, which I go through every day when I can't take the T. Um, oh, and by the way, when I take the T, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's, you know. Um, so we're going to have to get smarter about how what we can do in the short term but we're also going to have to keep the will to make a change even though this current administration and maybe this legislature isn't going to see the outcome of it because it's going to these mm -hmm. these take 5 10 20 years to build the infrastructure that we don't have so in the meantime We've got to, I think, focus on housing and making sure that people have housing and they have housing near transportation so that they can at least get on the T or they're near where they work. So housing is critical um, to, to helping to solve this problem. And then I know we're looking at congestion pricing, um, which people are very interested in. I have issues with because I think congestion pricing, that's when you you have certain tolls and they go up and down depending on the time of day. Okay. Great idea, 
except if you don't have an alternative, then what you're, you're just putting the burden on people who have to get in their cars to drive, right? Right. So when you say don't have an alternative, you mean you got to get no the public, public transportation. transportation. Right. Right. You know, you have to get that. You have to get that as a viable absolutely. option for people. If we had a great transportation system, I'd congestion price everybody on to everybody, everybody on to right, the train. I'd say buses. get on the train, get mm -hmm. on the bus, get on the, mm -hmm. um, you know, the T. But we don't have that. People don't have that choice. Um, it's going to mean that. Um, that business, that employers are going to have to say, okay, we'll have shifts. We won't have everybody coming in at eight or nine o'clock. We'll have shifts so that we can reduce some of the pressure on the streets. Are they willing to do that? Right. Okay, so everybody's going to have to just yet another thing that everybody's going to have to put skin in the game. So I wish I could tell you this is the answer and it's going to happen right now, mm -hmm. but it's not. We've, uh, we've got to... Um, We've got to have a short, to medium, and long term. I do believe we need to reduce the price on the T, that we should make it very cheap to ride buses and trains. I think the commuter rail prices are too high for many people coming from Bill Ricca or coming from, from um, uh, Newburyport. It's expensive to ride the commuter rail. Um, and I think we have to address that. We've got to reduce the prices. That's something we could do in the That's short That's something term. we could do, and you're saying that you really feel like that is something there's either data to show or it's your sense for sure that there are some number of people who are opting to get in their cars and get in increase the congestion simply because yeah. it costs too much for them it costs to take hundreds the train. of dollars for certain people to take the commuter rail every mm -hmm. month if you're a if you're a minimum wage worker or even if you're you know somebody making i don't know middle class a, a middle class wage that's a huge amount of money mm -hmm. a week Absolutely. Um, and we need to get people to work. And we need to keep, I mean, that's our job. Infrastructure is our job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, not, it's not the job of the private sector. It's the job of the government to right. provide that. So, One more job of the government that I just wanted, the last thing that I know that I want to ask you about other than uh, one little thing about Arlington that I forgot to ask you about before. But uh, one other thing that the government, in my opinion, is responsible for is um, addressing and reducing discrimination in all its different forms and you know from racial discrimination through sexual orientation through everything else um, I know also that that's an area that you're always working uh, to 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 mitigate um, I'm wondering if there are any er any updates on legislation that you're doing um, in the sexual harassment or discrimination area anything like that well I do have a bill <laughs> and um, the bill would include uh, venture capitalist firms and, and um, uh, grant uh, makers to come under our sexual, our, our protected class rules. So right now, employers have all sorts of requirements and, and statutes around what they can and can't do. Um, and that are per, for protection of people and, and to um, give people the right if they are being um, discriminated against to seek um, recourse. Uh -huh. recourse. It turns out that venture capitalists and grant makers in general do not fall under that category because they're not um, typical employers. Um, and it also turns out that, uh, especially in the venture capitalist world, there is a lot of discrimination, especially um, gender hmm. and, um, well, I'm sure, I'm sure minority too, but, but gender is what I know about. Mm -hmm. and, and so this, this bill would just say, if you are in a, that type of employer, you, you, fall, also, under, you mm -hmm. fall under the, the requirements that we have for all other employers. And so that's a bill that I've been working on and um, I think has some legs and hopefully we'll see, we'll see that move. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, anything else from your world that we haven't covered that you w would like people to know about? Well, probably, but... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it'll come to you as okay, you answer, answer the, the following the question, question. Okay. which is um, there is one, you know, well, if it's an ongoing issue, and yet, and and it, it's cropped back up again on on the Arlington radar, and that is 
um, disposition of the Mugar property. Mm. Um, we have been talking about this. Arlington has been concerned with this uh, for years and years now. Um, but it is that property abutting, um, abutting Route 2 near Alewife's uh, that is, there's going to be development there, it looks like. Um, the town has long opposed the development as it has been posited uh, up till now. Um, what are your what are your opinions about it? And um, yeah, I guess that's what I would like to know. Where where do you stand? So I am very much opposed to um, the Mugar development, especially as we are seeing it from Oak Tree. I think they're still called Oak Tree. Mm -hmm, I believe um, so. I have always, I've opposed it in the past, I oppose it now. It is, does not belong in that um, place. I'm a huge proponent of affordable housing, um, but that size development, it so clearly does not belong there. And um, I, I empathize with the neighborhood. I empathize with the people who are trying to stop it. Um, I um, firmly am in support of the work that they are doing, and I will do anything I can as the state senator um, to help the town address the issues um, around that development. And I know they just um, got a ruling um, from DHCD that it can move forward. It's going to be going, to, I think, to the zoning mm -hmm. board. It it just doesn't belong there. And um, all you have to do, probably you can do it today, is drive down Alewife Brook Parkway um, or drive down that inner, that um, exchange around the uh, T, and you will see um, how, what a disaster it is in terms of flooding and being able to mitigate water. And the thought of just putting more massive buildings on there is just, um, it defies logic. So um, we will, uh, you know, I will, I'll, I'll support how, it, I'll support the town and the neighborhood in any way I can as the state senator. Um, it's, it's tough to change, you know, this is a 40B. Um, it's very hard to change that legislation, but it's clear that we have to relook at that um, in a very thoughtful way so that we continue to make strides in affordable housing, which is the most important thing right now across the state um, is housing. And um, so we really need to make sure that we have housing for people and we have to do it in a way that it can coexist with our environment, which is very, very fragile right now. Thanks for that. Yeah. And, uh, and that's a wrap as far as I'm concerned, unless there's anything that we, uh, like all of a sudden you've remembered anything <laughs> that, uh, that you'd like to mention. If not, that's fine. Um, no, I think we covered um, a lot of uh, good areas, but I really appreciate being able to come on and talk to you and um, be here at ACMI. Yeah, it's a great rhythm that we've developed, and uh, I, we appreciate both you and your office working with us because this is what one of the things that we see as a real public service that we can offer to uh, the residents of Arlington and, frankly, the rest of your district as well. Um, but we, you know, uh, I've said it before. I'm sure I'll say it again. We really do appreciate the fact that you come on here. You give as straightforward an answer to every question that we ask as you are able to do. And uh, it is both refreshing, but also, I said, you were, it's illuminating to talk to you. It is, because that's what we're getting. So we're, we're very appreciative of that. Well, thank you. And we look forward to the next conversation, as always. I do, too. And uh, that's it, folks. Um, I'm James Milan. This has been Talk of the Town with our state senator, Cindy Friedman. We appreciate you joining us, and we'll see you next time.